some dated language in it and so forth. But when you hop over that, it's just, it's a wonderful book to study and discuss. Uh, there are details in the announcements. And I think, I don't think there's anything else imminent, so we'll go ahead. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Alleluia. Alleluia. As we prepare our hearts and minds to gather as a community with God and for God and to worship God, let's join in our responsive call to worship. How lovely is the dwelling place of the Lord Almighty. Those who live in God's house are happy and sing God's praise forever. For a day in God's house is better than a thousand elsewhere. It is better to serve in God's house than to live in the homes of the wicked. The Lord is our shield and protection. All who trust in God find happiness. Let us worship God. as king your lord and king adore rejoice give thanks and sing a triumphs evermore lift up your heart lift up your voice rejoice again i say rejoice god's kingdom cannot fail Christ rules o'er earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in glorious hope, for Christ the judge shall come. To glorify the saints through their eternal home. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Please be seated. We indeed rejoice that the Lord is King but not the kind of king that we see in stories, remote and inaccessible and arbitrary and capricious. This king is approachable. We fall short of the king's standards, but we can always come to him and confess, ask for forgiveness, and know 
that it will be given. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we confess that we put on airs more often than we put on your armor. We clothe ourselves in lies instead of the truth. We try to protect ourselves with arrogance, superstition, and self-reliance instead of with righteousness, faith, and your gift of salvation. Our footsteps do not follow your path of peace. We use your word to attack others instead of examining ourselves. Forgive us, Lord. Give us wisdom and strength to change our ways so that we may live as your faithful ambassadors of the good news. Amen. Paul tells us that if anybody is in Christ, they become a new creation. Our old selves pass away. We put on the new self that God has given us. Friends, hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever, world without end. Amen. We're forgiven. Peace comes to our hearts. We become ambassadors of peace. We share it with each other and with the world. So those with us online, wherever you happen to find yourself, whatever your situation is, know that we greet you, we send you God's peace. And for those of us who are here, Let's take a moment to look around, see who else is here, and share the peace of Christ. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. As we prepare to hear God's word for us this morning, let's pray together. Holy God, by your Spirit, speak your word to us and open our hearts to receive it. Teach us, challenge us, confront us with your word of grace, and give us faith and courage to respond in love with obedience. Amen. Our first reading continues in the long bread saga in the sixth chapter of John. Jesus is talking to a sizable group of people at this point. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of the disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, 
many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the word of the Lord. So here we are. Ah, oh, it's the bread again. Oh my gosh. We're past the middle of August. Soon it's going to be back to school time. Some students are happy about this and others not so much. Maybe there's some excitement or some nervousness, especially for those who are starting in a new school. And with things changing from week to week with the pandemic, you don't necessarily know what you're going to be expecting at school. So if you're nervous, nothing to be ashamed about. There is a lot going on. And in the school year, you always have many, many choices you can make. A lot of them are little choices that don't really matter a whole lot in the greater scheme of things, like what you're going to wear today, or where you want to sit if you don't have assigned seating, or what you're going to have for lunch if there are menu options. Then there's other choices you make which are a whole lot more important, and when you choose badly, it can cause trouble. Every classroom has its rules, and you choose whether you're going to follow them. You'll also be choosing who your friends are. If you choose the wrong kind of friends who are into getting into trouble, then you could end up getting into trouble too. Or in the classroom, what if the teacher says something and you just don't understand it? Are you going to pretend that you do? Are you going to clam up? Or do you go to the teacher and ask for help or ask for more explanations? Some of your choices will affect other people if masks are optional in your school. Choose to wear one to help keep other people safe. There could be peer pressure on that one. You might get teased. But remember, we're all looking out for one another. In our reading this morning, we see followers of Jesus facing tough decisions. Sometimes the teachings of Jesus were hard to understand. And this bread stuff that we've been going on and on about for the last month or so, that was hard for people to understand. And at this point, after he said this over and over again, some of them said, you know, this is rough. This is a hard teaching. How can anyone accept it? And some of them quit following Jesus after that day. There may have been many different reasons. I can think of at least a couple. Some of them may have heard him say, your ancestors ate the old bread from heaven and they died. If you eat this new bread from heaven, you're going to live forever. And by the way, I'm the new bread. You could see people thinking, this guy, what, he thinks he's better than Moses when Moses gave us manna from heaven? Boy, is he stuck on himself. Nah, I'm done. Not going to follow him anymore. There might have been other people who heard Jesus say, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who feeds on me will live forever. And you can just see some of the people going, ew, that's just gross. Uh, I don't do cannibalism, thank you. Anyway, I am out of here. And Jesus knew that people were grumbling and complaining. And he looked around, and there weren't a whole lot left. Just the original 12 and a few others. So, are you guys going to take off too, Jesus says? And then Peter speaks up. Bless Peter's heart. You know, as you read through the Gospels, there are times when Peter says some dumb stuff, some goofy stuff. But this time... He gets it right. Peter says, Jesus, where would we go? We've been listening to you for quite a while now, and just learning from you makes us feel more alive. And we know that God sent you to us. So the disciples who stayed had answered this call to follow Jesus, 
and they made that decision to stay with him, they're not about to turn back. And every single one of us faces that decision that those first disciples faced. At different times in our lives, we may have to consciously decide, are we going to follow Jesus? Or are we looking for somebody else who talks a good game and kind of seems cooler in some way? It's not always easy to follow Jesus. But like Peter said, where else can we go? Jesus is the one who came from God. Jesus is the one who gives eternal life. And when we follow Jesus, that helps guide the other decisions that we have to make. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus, the only one who can give us the gift of eternal life. And Jesus, we thank you for being with us in our everyday lives, whether it's at school or at work or in the home. And thank you for helping us when we need to make decisions that matter. Amen. some wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the universe displayed then sings my soul my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. In our second reading, we're continuing our journey through Paul's letter to the Ephesians. He's getting near the end, and he's starting to wind up and try to tie everything together that he's been telling people. Finally, be strong in the Lord 
and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, as we consider what you have to say to us this morning, let my words be your words, and let our thoughts be your thoughts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Looking back, two years ago, unless we were somehow involved in the medical profession, most of us probably wouldn't have known what the abbreviation PPE stood for. Today, of course, the coronavirus is in the news every day, and we've all become familiar with personal protective equipment. Healthcare workers who deal directly with coronavirus patients know that the vulnerable areas where the virus and other pathogens can enter their bodies are the eyes and face, the hands, body, respiratory system, and ears. We've all seen the pictures of fully garbed hospital workers, the eye and face protection, including masks and face shields protecting their eyes and their ears and their breathing, the gloves that protect their hands, the disposable body coverings for all the rest of them. In our own daily lives, we've gotten really familiar with that basic piece of safety equipment that we're using to protect ourselves and one another. Good old face mask. We've learned about the right way to wear it, covering the nose and the mouth, instructions given on how to put it on and take it off the right way, and so forth. And we've been reminded that there's a right way to wash our hands as well to do some basic protecting. As I was reading this passage from Paul's letter, I couldn't help wondering that if Paul was writing this letter today, perhaps instead of talking about putting on the armor of God, he might have described truth and righteousness and salvation and the shoes of peace and faith and prayer as being God's PPE for us. He might have talked about how to use those things as defense against spiritual infection. And it's not really that big a stretch to make. When you look at the medical profession's checklist of vulnerable zones, it reminded me of a Bible school song I learned when I was about yay big. Each verse talked about a different part of our bodies. And so the song started out, 
Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. There's a father up above who is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. And then the next verse was, be careful, little ears, what you hear. And then be careful, little hands, what you do. Be careful, little mouth, what you speak. And be careful, little feet, where you go. All of the same zones that need protection. But let's get back to Paul and his time and place. Roman soldiers were everywhere. They would have been a familiar sight to anybody living in that part of the world. And since Paul was in prison, as he wrote this letter, it's likely he saw them every single day. And as we think about the gospel story, that crowd, that crew of people who put Jesus to death and sat around the foot of the cross throwing dice for his clothes, they were a bunch of guys dressed in this armor. But Paul, in, in I just think a brilliant stroke of genius, took this symbol of oppression and he flipped it on its head and now he's using it as a symbol of things that help us preach the gospel of peace. Now, as we look at this passage, we have to be very careful and very aware of what it says and what it does not say. Military images are very easy to misuse. They can be taken out of context. They can be used to support oppression and militaristic activity. Just look back through history. Look at all the crusades. Look at all the wars that have been fought in the name of religion over the centuries. So this text is not a battle cry urging the church to usher in God's kingdom by attacking and rooting out all the forces standing in opposition to God. No, this passage, this text is a call for the saints to stand firm and withstand the attacks of evil that are being directed at them. The saints of God are defending against attacks. They're not initiating them and going out and making war. Paul does say we're involved in a struggle, but the struggle is not against enemies of flesh and blood, he says. It's not against other people. It's against what he calls cosmic powers of this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Hmm, heavenly places, okay. This is not the first time we've heard about the heavenly places in this letter. All the way back in the first chapter, Paul talked about how God won a cosmic victory over every rule and authority and power and dominion through the resurrection of Christ and about how Christ is seated at God's right hand in the heavenly places and about how God has put everything under the dominion of Christ in this age and in the age to come. But Paul's reminding us that even though God won the decisive battle and will win the final victory, the spiritual forces of evil are not giving up without a fight. They have not surrendered yet. The devil and all the evil powers of darkness, they still scheme against God. They still work to try to divide us and destroy us. They still attack the saints of God. So Paul urges Christians to be properly equipped for this cosmic battle. How do we defend ourselves against these unseen enemies, these principalities and powers that are working against us and against God's will? Paul says we do it by putting on the armor of God. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, the word of God, and prayer. Paul likes this getting dressed image, putting on. He uses it in other places. Back in chapter 4, he tells us to put on the new self that God created and gave us in Christ. He uses similar images of getting dressed 
in his letter to the Colossians, he says, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, and above all, clothe, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So let's take a look at the individual components of this armor. The most important thing to remember about these items is that the vast majority of them are not offensive weapons. They are not instruments of destruction. Rather, they are gear that defends and protects. The only piece of this armor that can be used for offense is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. But even that, that is also can be used as a defense. When you have a sword and you're in a sword fight, you can block the blows of your opponent. You can parry. We have a great example of this if we think about the story of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, that's what he used to ward off the temptation. He was tempted to turn loaves, stones into loaves of bread. And he said, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God's mouth. Then he was tempted, throw yourself off the top of the temple, because it says the angels are going to protect you. Jesus turns to the word, and he says, again, it is written, don't test God. And then the devil offers him, I'll give you the whole world if you just worship me. And Jesus says, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So Jesus was using this as a defense. Then we've got the belt. The belt holds up the toga so the soldier can move without getting tangled up in the cloth. So fastening the belt of truth goes back to something Paul talked about in one of the earlier chapters. Speaking truth in love as part of our growth in Christ. The belt of truth protects the church. It lets us be flexible. We can go as we're sent. We can walk. We can run. And we are free from lies that could trip us up and interfere with what we're called to do. And then we've got the breastplate. The breastplate protects the vital organs and the core part of the body. It protects against attacks front and back. The breastplate of righteousness protects the heart and the lifeblood from the cosmic evil. So when we put on the breastplate of righteousness, we're remembering how our new self was created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And this goes back to chapter 4 when Paul says, put on the new self that God has given you. And then you've got the shoes. Shoes protected a soldier from disabling blows to his feet. If a soldier got taken down by a blow to the feet, he's going to be pretty much done for at that point. And for Paul, the shoes also symbolized being ready to go where we're called, being ready to stand on our feet and speak the gospel of peace. You might say the shoes are the most important part of this wardrobe of armor. All the other pieces protect us so we can do what the shoes help us do, speaking peace. Paul talks about the helmet of salvation. Now, I don't know if they knew that we think with our brains back then, but nonetheless, a blow to the head is not a good thing to get. And so the helmet the helmet of salvation, we can think about our baptism. We can think about the image 
in, in some traditions, say on Ash Wednesday, when, when there's a cross made on our forehead, or sometimes when a person is baptized, they also take oil and make a cross on the forehead. This reminds us that we've been saved by grace through faith, not because of our human action, but because of God's action as a pure gift. So the helmet of salvation helps protect us against these cosmic evil powers. And then we've got the shield. The shield is a defense against those flaming arrows. Now, Roman shields, they were made out of leather, and they would wet them down to protect them from incoming flaming arrows. Now, unlike this shield, the Roman shields were huge. They were tall, and they were rectangular in shape. And they were big enough to cover not only the person holding this shield, but about a third of another person. And they made them that way in such a way that you could actually hook them together. The shields could be linked, and the soldiers behind them would form what they called a shield wall. And the shield wall would protect not only the soldiers on the front lines, but their comrades behind them. Very powerful protection. And so the church, armed with faith, and defend itself from assaults by people who don't know that the gospel is about peace. Now, this shield wall concept brings up another important, another important point about this reading. It is a mistake to interpret this reading as telling us to individually dress ourselves as though we are preparing for some kind of solitary combat against individual temptation or opposition. If you remember, a couple weeks back, I talked about the plural you, the fact that we don't have a plural you in standard English. And so, in this passage, all of the verbs and all the pronouns in the Greek are plural. And we've lost that in translation. Paul didn't write this particular letter to a person. He wrote it to a community. And then it was shared in other communities as well. So we've got this plural you again. You all. Yins. You uns. Y'all. However you want to think about it. And this reminds us that evil is resisted by the church through the church's life together. Being a believer is not a solo expedition. The church stands against the wiles of the devil by practicing love and reconciliation, by striving for the peace and the righteousness that it's longing for and working for, not only in the world but within its own fellowship. The church stands against the wiles of the devil by its prayer, by its community proclamation of the gospel to the world. This armor of God is the armor of the church as a body. And remember, Paul loves talking about the church as the body. He does that in a bunch of places. You are the body, all the parts need each other, and so forth. So we wear these gifts together. We stand shoulder to shoulder. We support each other the way the Roman soldiers did when they were making a shield wall. And the church is not left on its own to do this. The opening instruction in verse 10 says, Be strong. Be strong in the Lord. It reminds us that we are to be strengthened as a community by God in all the ways that Paul describes earlier in the letter. Living with love and peace toward one another. Singing hymns to God. Speaking truth. Forgiving one another. Reflecting Christ in our homes and in our closest relationships. So when Paul tells us to stand firm... 
This isn't something we have to do by ourselves. We do it as a community. And it's ongoing. It's not a once and done kind of thing. So when you look at that phrase, be strong in the Lord, it might be better loosely translated as all of you together keep on being strengthened by the Lord. It's something we're never finished with. It's ongoing as we cultivate this lifelong habit of trusting God and finding life and love and strength in God. As Paul continues and finishes with the armor components, he also talks about prayer. Prayer is a major piece of God's PPE for us. Because when we pray, it shows we're not relying on our own abilities, but we're trusting in God's care and we're remaining open to those nudges from the Holy Spirit that might send us unexpected places. One of my best friends is a full-time college professor, and now she's also a seminary student. She's going kicking and screaming, but <laughs> the Holy Spirit has said to her, this is what you are meant to do. So prayer, and she prayed about it a lot. And the prayer opened her to the nudges from the Spirit to say, yep, this is, this is the next adventure we're sending you on. Then Paul tells us to pray for all the saints. He's reminding us that we're connected to one another as members of the body of Christ. And we continue to grow together in love. At the end of this reading, Paul says something very important that's easy to miss. He says, Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. Even Paul, who 2,000 years later, we look back at him and think, oh yeah, he's some kind of spiritual giant. Even Paul knows he's dependent on the strength that God gives. He's dependent on his ties to the community. He's dependent on their prayers. All of those things in order to proclaim the gospel in the face of opposition. And you know, this is a great reminder for all of us that worship is intended to be an endeavor of the whole community, actively participating. It's not meant to be a passive thing where we just show up and let it wash over us. Whoever your pastor is, you should always be praying this for him or her, that God will give a message to that pastor to speak. Sermons don't write themselves. And some of them are tougher than others. Overall, in this passage, Paul is telling us that only God can defeat the forces of evil. And he's going to do it. And until that day, the church is the sign and the promise of what God plans to do for the whole world through Christ. And we, the church, have been enlisted in this mission. And we can respond boldly because God has already won the war and set us free. We don't need to fear whatever challenges are facing the church in our own time and place. We've been given all that we need to stand strong against that losing effort of the forces that are in opposition to God's peace. Because we've got the armor of God or in today's terms, God's PPE that is protecting us. And so we pray with Paul. Now to the one who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or imagine. To God be glory forever. Amen. Hymn number 260. Mighty 
fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Thus ask who that may be, Christ Jesus it is he, Lord Sabbath his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils fill Should threaten to undo us We will not fear for God hath will His truth to triumph through us The Prince of Darkness grim We tremble not for Him his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gifts are ours. Through him with the side of that good and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abide us still, his kingdom is forever. As we contemplate the help that God has given us, let's affirm our faith together. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed. Jesus was crucified suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father, in sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers 
in the one body of Christ, the church, in gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. As we prepare to join our hearts together in prayer, some concerns. Our prayer families this week are the Winter family and the Young family. We are praying for Middletown, the Middletown Presbyterian Congregation and their pastor, Christian Newbaum. Christian is also a military chaplain in the reserves, so he is doing two completely different ministries all at the same time. Reminder to keep Susan Asbury in your prayers. She's back home. She looks a little beat up. I noticed that people have been asking her what happened to the other guy. Um, she is recovering from her fall from the bike, but she's feeling a little, little peaky yet. So keep her in your prayers. Also, keep the congregation of St. Andrews in your prayers. Our congregation has three funerals this week. There was one yesterday, and there's another, another two coming up uh, during the middle of the week. The offering plate, as usual, is in the narthex. If you didn't catch it on the way in, you can catch it on the way out. If you're with us online, we have online giving or you can send a check to the church. These offerings are helping St. James be part of the presence of God, part of the community that preaches the gospel of peace to the world. So let's take a moment to pray and dedicate the offerings that we are making. God of goodness and mercy, as we bring you our offerings, we thank you for all the ways you've blessed us. You fill us with hope and confidence. And so we give you our commitment and trust. As we seek to be faithful, use our gifts according to your will. Mold us to your purposes. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Loving God, we come together trusting you to give us everything we need. We thank you for giving us the strength and the armor to defend ourselves against the forces of evil and division in the world. Help us share the gospel of peace with everyone we meet. It's been a rough week in the world, Lord. With the help of your spirit, we have sighs that are too great for words. We pray for the land of Afghanistan, for its people, for all life inside its borders, for the military personnel and contractors who are still there, keep them safe. For those who are desperate for safety, people facing unimaginable decisions, we pray. We pray for those, too, who have chosen the way of violence and oppression. May their hearts be changed. And we pray for the women and the girls and for all people who had hopes for a brighter future and feel that their hope is now slipping away. We pray for all who are in harm's way for whatever reason, for those struggling to survive, those grieving great losses. And we pray for all those that you've sent to help with their suffering. We lift to you the efforts to help the people of Haiti after that deadly earthquake. We pray for the safety of all who are affected by the wildfires out west and the hurricanes in the Atlantic. Closer to home, we thank you that Susan is recovering from her bike accident. 
Give her strength and patience. Tell her it's okay to be kind to herself. We lift to you our prayer families, the Winters and the Youngs. We thank you for your love for them. And we ask your blessing on the work and the ministry of the Presbyterian Congregation of Middletown and their pastor, Christian Newbaum, and for his ministry as a military chaplain. And be with the congregation of St. Andrews as they deal with a series of losses of people dear to them. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Until we meet again, patient, 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 until we meet again. Lord, make us more faithful. Lord, make us more faithful. Lord, make us more faithful until we meet again. Faithful, faithful, faithful until we meet again. Go out into the world in peace. Hold on to what's good. Don't return evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted and help the suffering and honor everyone. The blessings of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>